and for being here. So because of the diverse interests of the audience, I've decided that I'm going to talk about both prenatal and cancer applications of cell-free DNA analysis. In this talk, I'm going to share with you what are the latest innovations in this field, and also to discuss how far we can push the limit of this technology based on what is currently achievable. <clears throat> Here are my disclosures. So maybe let's start talking about the baby. If we want to analyze the baby's DNA without posing any harm to the baby, one option is to use cell-free fetal DNA that is present in the mother's blood sample. The existence of cell-free fetal DNA in mother's blood was um, discovered in 1997. And to date, now we understand that that DNA actually comes from the placenta of the pregnancy. And it can be released into the peripheral circulation of the mother. And as you can see, it will be mixed with the black DNA molecules, which are actually contributed by the mother herself. And nowadays, we know that the majority of the mother's DNA is from the blood cells of the mother. So when we take a mother's blood sample, we're actually dealing with a mixture sample, with the small minority coming from the placenta, and the majority is actually coming from the mother. And also, please note this cartoon. Because the DNA is released after cell death, it's no longer nice, long DNA molecules. These are all fragmented, broken up DNA molecules. So broken up that the DNA molecules are only about 200 bases long or so. So if we wanted to make use of this material to do a um, detection of a condition such as Down syndrome, which most of the case is due to having three copies of chromosome 21, what can we do? The reason is because we no longer can analyze nice long pieces of chromosome. As I've just told you, the DNA is completely broken up. So um, back in 2008, we have um, developed this method. That is, maybe we just take a mother's blood sample, extract the DNA, and then we just use sequencing to count the DNA fragments. Just sequence a big pool and then count how many molecules actually come from chromosome 21. And if we were analyzing a sample from a woman who is pregnant with a baby that is, who is not affected by Down syndrome, we should get a certain percentage of DNA coming from chromosome 21, majority of those fragments contributed by the mother, and a minority contributed by the baby. And when we happen to be analyzing a sample from a woman who's carrying a baby affected with Down syndrome, then we should expect a small increase quantitative increase in the amount of chromosome 21 DNA in that sample contributed by the baby, as shown in the additional red pieces of fragment in the sample. So we're trying to develop a method that could distinguish this small increase in chromosome 21 DNA molecules um, in the sample as the basis to um, detect whether the baby might have Down syndrome. So after developing this method, back in 2011, I led the first um, large-scale clinical trial to assess the accuracy of this method. And based on that first trial, the data were very encouraging in that we found that uh, the technique can detect more than 99% of the uh, pregnancies affect affected with Down syndrome. Uh, but more encouraging is that it has a false positive rate of about 0.1%. And when we did this study, because it was the first time, we wanted to be cost-effective, so we focused on high-risk pregnancies. High-risk being defined at that time, that is women of um, older than certain age group, um, with um, positive new, um, ultrasound findings and positive uh, serum biochemical um, screening. And within 2011 and 2012, other groups around the world have actually replicated the study and found it to be the performance, the diagnostic, uh, the detection performance was of similar level. And so by December 2012, so you can see that this field really moved extremely rapidly. By December 2012, there were already professional societies, such as the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They have issued professional statements saying that, well, the technology is, has reached a stage that if uh, in certain situations, particularly high risk um, women who are high risk for Down syndrome, um, and if they 
consent for having this test, um, this non-invasive prenatal testing approach may be applicable to those women. And after this um, guideline, actually different um, professional societies also issued similar guidelines. So within a very short period of time, the, um, this non-invasive prenatal um, um, screening test for Down syndrome became commercially available in different parts of the world. But then soon thereafter, people started to investigate, well, if we are directly detecting the amount of chromosome 21 DNA in the sample, there shouldn't be too much of a difference if the woman is of high risk or the woman is of average risk. As long as the baby has Down syndrome, we should still be able to use this technology to see the pathology. And so other researchers have started to apply the test onto what we call average risk pregnancies. And this is actually a summary of um, the performance data of many studies performed um, during that um, few years. And then you can see that the pooled sensitivity for using um, this technology or this approach to detect trisomy 21, 18, and 13 is quite high. But what is very encouraging is that all the studies have shown that this technique has very high specificity. So the false positive rate is usually less than 0.05, um, uh, usually less than 0.5%. Um, and so um, this is the key advantage because before um, non-invasive DNA-based testing was available, um, the um, conventional way to non-invasively screen for fetal chromosomal aneuploidy would be based on ultrasound assessment of the nucleotranslucency and also the serum biochemical screening. And the most popular protocol that has been practiced around the world would be the first trimester combined test. And you can see that the first trimester combined test actually has 5%, about 5% false positive rate. And the question is, what does this mean? The difference in the uh, false positive rates of the two approaches, what difference does it make in real life? So Diana Bianchi, she um, uh, performed a study and actually compared the conventional approach, which she calls standard screening on this slide, with the cell-free DNA-based testing back to back in the same cohort of pregnancy. In this particular cohort, um, both technologies uh, or both approaches could detect all of the Down syndrome cases. But the specificity of the two approaches were as expected. Uh, that is, the cell-free DNA testing, the uh, false positive rate was less than 0.5%, whereas the standard screening, the false positive rate was about 4%. The numbers may seem small in difference, but it it translates to a huge difference clinically because what it really matters is the positive predictive value. Positive predictive value means when a patient receives a positive report, a report that says test positive, the baby might have Down syndrome, what percentage of those positive reports actually were true? So you can see that because cell-free DNA testing has a much lower um, false positive rate, about 50% of the positive test reports generally capture affected baby. Whereas for the standard serum um, biochemistry-based screening, um, only 4% uh, uh, of those um, positive test reports were covering babies who were genuinely positive. So you can see that there is a tenfold difference in positive predictive values. That means that in the old days, using standard serum um, screening, then most of the time when a woman receives a positive report, basically, you, 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 you would think that, well, it might not be true. But nowadays, with cell-free DNA testing, then um, it's a um, much bigger deal because it's much more likely that the baby is genuinely affected. So that's the clinical implication. And because of subsequent to these studies um, having been um, published, then some of the professional um, societies have revised the guideline. And um, this uh, set of revisions came in 2015 and 2016. And then they um, now updated the guideline and say that, well, in appropriate pregnancies and in uh, women who consent to have the technology, um, the uh, cell-free DNA testing approach may be applicable beyond the high-risk um, women. 
So with this, um, um, the cell-free DNA uh, way of um, screening fetal chromosomal aneuploidy um, really expanded worldwide. And now it's um, offered um, in more than 100 countries around the world. And each year, it has been estimated that at least 6 million pregnancies um, receive um, tests based on these technologies. And um, because of this development, um, up to a certain stage, um, most of the testing um, were offered by private commercial companies. And um, because the technology became um, relatively mature, so some of the um, governments and the regulatory bodies around the world begin to think about um, adopting the test in the public health service. And in fact, here in Europe, you've beat the rest of the world in doing this. For example, since July 1st, 2017, Belgium was the first country in the world to uh, decide to reimburse um, non-invasive prenatal testing based on cell-free DNA for the screening of fetal chromosomal aneuploidy on all women who's eligible on the public health service. And they have chosen to offer to all, we, uh, all eligible women, that is high risk and average risk. You can see that through these slides, Different governments will have different interpretation. So um, there are different ways to implement um, this um, technology into the routine prenatal care pathway or protocol. Then, of course, the Dutch, they, have, um, they were one of the earliest to start to do cost-effective studies. And um, so um, since 2017, they have also expanded their cost-effective studies um, to compare conventional first trimester combined screening versus cell-free DNA screening for all women the cost effectiveness of it. And um, the study results are due to be released in 2020. And then from then on, we'll see how the Dutch will implement the technology. Then in the UK, they've done studies um, comparing different protocols. And then they study the Down syndrome detection rate, the miscarriage rates, um, the rates of doing invasive tests, and the cost of implementing the various protocols. And then in the end, they uh, probably have chosen to only offer it to very high risk women. Um, high risk, namely women who have been screened, let's say by first trimester combined testing, and found to have a risk of carrying an affected baby of more than one in 150. All right, so you can see that this is another way of implementing the, um, the approach. What's happening in Hong Kong? So this is actually an old photograph showing the um, old airport that we stopped using about 20 years ago. And in the old days, the um, big jumbo jet needs to fly through the middle of town in between the apartments to land. And because the airport is gone, now the airport has become the first Hong Kong Children's Hospital. And this hospital has just opened its doors in October last year. And then this year, this hospital will be the first public hospital to offer the cell-free DNA testing approach for or, um, fetal chromosomal aneuploidy screening. And in Hong Kong, um, the hospital authority has also decided to adopt the high-risk approach. So they would still offer first trimester combined screening, and only those who are high risk uh, would then go on to have the uh, DNA test um, before um, further invasive testing. So um, although I've told you that the uh, cell-free DNA testing approach has very high detection rate, it still has about a 0.1, 0.2, or 0.3% false positive rate. So we cannot just base um, on the cell-free DNA testing results to decide what to do with the baby. So any positive result, we still advocate the um, performance of invasive diagnostic procedures, such as in the form of coronal filler sampling or amniocentesis. But since the commercial launch of NIPT in 2011, the obstetricians found out that we created a new problem. That is, there are far fewer cases requiring the performance of CVS or amniocentesis, as shown in this slide. You can see the significant drop after 2012. And because of that, the obstetrician found out that they didn't have enough cases to actually practice or learn to do amniocentesis. So much so that they need to develop model systems, as shown in this publication, to teach their trainees how to do amniocentesis. And actually, this is a worry, because previously, we tried to avoid doing amniocentesis because of the small chance of fetal miscarriage. But now, if the obstetricians have fewer opportunities to train, then maybe the um, they, degree of danger um, associated with the, uh, with the technology may further increase. We don't know. So it's very important um, for this um, approach to um, 
remain in reference centers um, for um, the obstetricians to get enough of a practice to do these procedures, which is needed for confirming the um, fetal status. And as I said, um, now this technology has actually um, um, advanced a lot. So besides detecting whole chromosome abnormalities in the baby, we can actually zoom in within the chromosomes and look at specific genes and then to use non-invasive approaches to detect fetal single gene diseases, such as cystic fibrosis, thalassemias, and according to Omen, there are close to 5,000 uh, phenotypes of various single gene diseases that have been um, um, discovered, and the global prevalence of all single gene diseases at birth is actually um, 10 in 1,000 that is one in 100. So the global burden of this, or the morbidity associated with um, single gene disease is actually bigger than fetal chromosomal um, aneuploidy in terms of prevalence and incidence. So we thought about how can we make use of cell-free fetal DNA in mother's plasma to determine single gene diseases? Well, back in um, um, 1998 and um, 1997, we thought of very simple things, that is, in a mother's blood sample, if we suddenly detected the presence of Y chromosome in the woman's blood sample, it would mean that the baby is a male baby. And the immediate clinical utility of that is for the management of sex-linked diseases, such as hemophilia, which um, only mainly manifest in, um, have major manifestations in male babies rather than female babies. So back in those days, people have advocated the clinical utility is that if in a woman who's at risk of giving birth to a baby with hemophilia, and if we did not detect Y chromosome, it means that the baby is likely to be female, and if the baby is likely to be female, that means the baby is unlikely to be affected by um, the sex-linked disease. So using this approach, one might be able to cut down the need for invasive diagnostic tests by 50%, because 50% of the babies will be female. But in our group, we thought, that's not good enough, because what if we do detect Y chromosome, and um, the, um, that means it's a male baby, that male baby would have a 50% chance of being affected. Can we do something about it? So we thought about, well, in at-risk pregnancies, the woman would be a carrier for a mutation on her chromosome X. So she would have one mutant allele and one normal allele. And the baby is a 50-50% um, chance pick. The baby would, uh, a male baby would either inherit the mutant allele or the normal allele, all right? And if you look at this slide, we thought, hey, how about we develop a technology to count the number of mutant alleles and the normal alleles in the mother's plasma? Before she's pregnant, it should be equal number. But when she's pregnant, there should be a little bit more of one of the alleles depending on which allele the baby has inherited. So for example, if the baby has inherited the red allele, the mutant allele, there should be more of the red than the blue in her circulation. And so we actually developed um, a, um, um, uh, we, we, we actually furthered this principle and we adopted digital PCR to count the alleles. So digital PCR is, instead of analyzing for the presence of gene in one big soup of the sample, we would dilute out the sample into tens of thousands of different bowls of soups. And then the sample is so diluted that each bowl of soup will either contain no DNA molecule, or if it does contain DNA molecule, it just happens to contain one fragment. All right? And then when we apply the PCR assay, uh, it would then detect whether that fragment is mutant or not mutant. So we, at the end of this essay, we simply count the number of reds versus the number of blues to work out if the baby is affected or not affected. And we've actually published um, these um, 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 approaches and data. And um, this is the publication on hemophilia uh, in the article Blood. And to our surprise, when we published this article, the editorial commentary that came with us actually came with a very nice poem. And I'll read part of it to you. So it says, Prenatal diagnosis is a must. In digital PCR, we trust. With blood from carrier moms, alleles are compared, mutant and non. For, fetal, for a fetus of male sex, with mutant allele excess, diagnosis is elemental, and compared with amnio, so gentle. It captured the science precisely better than I, the way that I could present to you. 
And um, actually, um, the authors also said that it would complement um, some of the public health agenda in the US very well. Because in the US, uh, it has been planned to actually screen for all carrier mums. That is, if they detect one carrier mum, they would then screen the relatives to identify other carrier mums. And in the past, they were thinking of the issue of after having identified the carrier women, how to deal with their pregnancies, whether to use invasive approaches to further diagnose the baby. And you know, in hemophilia, actually there is a bleeding tendency. So one would try to avoid using invasive approaches. So now we're, there is a possibility of actually checking the fetal genotype status by the non-invasive approaches. So, um, that is just a snapshot of how um, the technology has evolved. And because the resolution of the technology has improved so much, we started to detect things that we didn't think that we would detect. And let me um, show you um, this um, by this case. So this was a, a non-invasive prenatal screening um, request from a pregnancy at 11th week of gestation. And I was consulted to interpret this report because the amount of chromosome 21 DNA in this sample was elevated. And it was extremely elevated. It was so elevated that the testing laboratory has never seen anything like that. And so they asked me for my opinion. So I looked at data and I said, it cannot be from the baby. Because remember, I told you, the baby's DNA only occupied a small proportion in the sample. So the baby cannot squeeze out that amount of chromosome 21 DNA into the sample. So it must be from the mother. And then I said, let me see the data from the other chromosomes. And then the lab sent the data. And then I saw that there are chromosome copy number gains, not just in chromosome 21, but also on chromosome 1, chromosome 17. And also there was a chromosome copy deletion um, on chromosome um, 6. So there is multiple chromosome abnormality. So what adult condition can have multiple chromosome abnormality? The answer is malignancy, all right? And actually, I encountered this case even before um, the mainstream publications started to say that non-invasive prenatal testing can detect occult maternal malignancy. So when I um, interpreted this case, I had to think about how to communicate this result to the referral clinician. And so I called the referral clinician and then I was thinking, he won't believe this ridiculous thing that I was going to say. And then I said to him, I said, I'm going to tell you something serious. Um, you might not believe me, but the sample that uh, you uh, sent from your client, we detected multiple chromosome abnormality. And I'm really worried for this um, woman because on the other, I said, um, our other research interest is on um, non-invasive cancer detection. And so I know that this technology can detect um, uh, malignancies. But fortunate, fortunate or unfortunate, the clinician, after hearing what I said, he said, you got it right. I was shocked. He then told me, actually what happened was, this was a woman with a prior history of a um, follicular lymphoma. She was cured, and so she went on to have a pregnancy. And then by 11 weeks, she sent a sample for non-invasive prenatal testing. And then she felt lumps on the neck. And so she went back to see her hematologist. And while we were doing the non-invasive prenatal testing, the hematologist already taken a fine needle biopsy from the lymph nodes. And actually, on the same day I was phoning the clinician, they already confirmed a recurrence of the follicle lymphoma. And this is why the two results just came on the same day. And so the clinician um, thought that our interpretation actually matched what they thought. Um, but to prove it, I then uh, spoke with the hematologist and said, can I have some of the biopsy material that you have taken from the lymph node to analyze with my technology? And so we actually got the lymph node biopsy and you can see the inner tract data. It is identical to the maternal plasma data that we've analyzed. And so that confirmed that the uh, abnormalities that we saw was not from the baby, was actually from the um, follicular lymphoma. And then that woman had to unfortunately terminate the pregnancy and then went on to have her treatment. She had chemotherapy and you can see that we have taken a blood sample from her after the chemotherapy. And you can see that the plasma abnormalities were no longer there. And so it means that the um, abnormal DNA coming from the lymphoma um, was probably um, um, gone. And so we, after encountering this case, we thought, 
Well, we have an interesting dilemma. That is, we can detect um, chromosomal abnormalities in a plasma sample easily, but we don't know where those DNA come from. So can we actually develop a test that would actually base on the abnormalities that we see and also inform us actually what organ is releasing those abnormal DNA to the peripheral circulation? So we decided to develop what, is what we call a plasma DNA tissue mapping test. That is to map what tissue is releasing what amounts of DNA into the peripheral circulation. And for this work, we decided to make use of DNA methylation. The reason is because, um, as you know, DNA methylation is um, involved in um, um, affecting gene expression. So every organ, because they have different function, they should express different genes. And because they express different genes, they should have different DNA methylation profiles. And actually, when we started to do this research, there were already public data available telling us what the entire methylome is in many different organs. So what I had to do was just to download the uh, methylome data um, um, from the public domain uh, of the different organs. And then we did very detailed bioinformatics analysis to um, compare the fine differences between the methylomes of those different organs, and then pick out the unique features per organ. And then we keep that, those unique features in our database. And in the end, we um, came up with about 6,000 um, um, regions in the genome that were useful for us to um, map the DNA uh, across different organs. Then, so with the data in the library, in our, our database, the next step is actually take a plasma sample. Instead of just doing DNA sequencing, we have to do bisulfite sequencing. That is a technology that will allow us to look at the methylation status of the DNA. So after we got the plasma DNA overall methylation status, we have to plug it into um, a very sophisticated equation to find out what are the relative proportions of the different organs that they will contribute in order to give the plasma methylome result as we have detected. So by solving these simultaneous equations, in the end, we would be able to then map which organ gave which percentage. So it sounds a little bit abstract, but let me um, um, show you um, how it's actually done. So um, we've then um, collected um, plasma sample from women who were pregnant in the first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester in pregnancies. And using this tissue mapping test, you can see that, of course, a certain proportion of DNA, as shown in the red, is from the placenta. So by the way, each bar is from the data from one pregnancy, and they all add up to 100%, okay? And you can see that besides the placenta, actually most of the plasma DNA in these samples are actually from the neutrophils. And this is the same. So for you and I, when we're not pregnant, um, the majority of the plasma DNA is actually from the neutrophils. And you can see that another um, class of blood cells, that is the lymphocytes, they usually will contribute less than 20% of the DNA into the circulation. So these are women without lymphoma, okay, bear in mind. And then liver being one of the largest solid organs in the, ba uh, in the body, it would release a, about a single digit um, percentage of DNA into the per peripheral circulation. And then we apply this technology onto our um, patient with the lymphoma. You can see that when we analyzed it, more than 20%, 60% of the DNA actually came from the B lymphocytes. All right, so this tissue mapping test tells us that there's something wrong with this patient. Majority of DNA is not from the neutrophils. They are from the B lymphocytes. And then, we, because we have 6,000 markers across the genome, we can also pick the markers that are on chromosome 21 and then do the same analysis again and then ask, so which organ is contributing most of the DNA that is released by chromosome 21 in this sample? And in this woman, it turns out to be the B lymphocytes. And just to show you the reference control, we also collected plasma samples from women who um, were carrying Down syndrome babies, and then, uh, of course, with elevated chromosome 21 DNA content. And when we apply this test, you can see that it is the placenta that is contributing most of the chromosome 21 molecules that we detect in the sample. So um, this is um, a technology that we are still um, um, further developing, and uh, it might have a role in um, the future because um, studies like this one have shown that when you do NIPT for prenatal testing purposes, out of 450,000 cases, 
they detected about 40 cases with multiple chromosomal abnormalities. And of these 40, half of them were actually benign fibroids. So now we know that benign fibroids can also release um, a, 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 a DNA that has copy number gains or losses in the circulation. And the remaining um, 20 out of the 450,000 cases, they were maternal malignancies. So the odds of detecting an occult maternal malignancy in, uh, uh, well, during the context of non-invasive prenatal testing is one in 20,000, all right? So, um, so if you are practicing this technology, there might be um, an occasion where you have to think of this. So actually, um, this um, work has led us to think, well, what more can we do, um, use this technology to help with the cancer epidemic? So the women, uh, the uh, women with the occult malignancy, um, whom we've detected during uh, prenatal testing, well, they were women who were not even aware that they had cancer. So we thought, can we build cancer detection tests that is based on a plasma sample? And of course, um, in um, um, this field, people term this uh, as liquid biopsy, meaning that um, using a liquid sample in the form of a blood, uh, blood, uh, blood sample, um, we can actually uh, get DNA equivalent to a biopsy that is released from tumors of solid organs. All right, so this means that we can use a liquid form, a liquid sample um, as a surrogate of a solid tumor biopsy to do um, various analysis. And um, some of these um, approaches, liquid biopsy tests, um, have already um, been mature enough to be applied clinically in certain settings. And um, these are some of the typical data. Um, let me explain to you. So this is actually about the management of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancers. And now we know that it's important to know uh, the EGFR mutation status of these um, cases. EGFR is a gene, epidermal growth factor receptor. And if with certain mutations, um, you have to um, prescribe um, a um, certain um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which would give much better prognosis to the patient um, than uh, giving conventional chemotherapy. And so, for example, in this um, study, um, um, this um, group of patients, they actually have uh, EGFR, what we call resistant mutations. And with these mutations, one would need to give a second line tyrosine kinase um, uh, inhibitor. You cannot even give a first line. The first line will actually give um, worse prognosis. And um, you can see in this slide, um, one can either use a biopsy of the tumor, but because um, quite is quite often, it's difficult to get a biopsy from the lungs. And so um, people have resorted to use plasma samples, and they found out that the plasma samples to detect EGFR mutation status um, is also of clinical utility. And so after detecting the EGFR mutation, then the clinicians will make a decision of what drug to give to the patient. And so liquid biopsy has already made its way for the use for guiding selection of therapy and treatment monitoring. For the purpose of this morning's talk, I want you to look into the details. Personally, I think that just using liquid biopsy for selection of therapy in patients who have been diagnosed with cancer is not good enough. The reason is because even if we have carefully selected the therapy for the patient, for this particular data set, this cohort, by giving the second-line tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy, one is only prolonging the median progression-free survival from four months, that is based on chemotherapy, to eight months. So with all that effort, we are buying time for the patient, months at a time. So we thought we need a completely different approach if we want to be serious about cancer. Well, first, because we work in the chemical pathology lab, our specialty is diagnostics, so we thought, can we improve the diagnostics? Maybe. We are diagnosing cancer too late. So late that even with the latest drugs, they have limited efficacy. What if we can diagnose cancer early? So early that maybe even all the existing therapies that are available to us, they would have better efficacy. And in order to do this, we have to think about how we diagnose cancer right now. And all of you know that we don't have perfect cancer detection tests 
And so now we typically need to wait for patients to develop signs and symptoms. And based on those signs and symptoms, we pick the relevant tests to apply. And the statistics is telling us that this sit and wait approach is definitely not good enough because most of the cancers that we detect, they're just too late. So we thought we have to move into the screening phase. Maybe we have to detect cancer in people who are well. That is before people feel the signs and symptoms, present with the signs and symptoms of the cancer. And so we looked at, um, of course, all you know that um, there are some very good um, cancer screening modalities available. But some of these screening modalities, they require the installation of um, um, radio, um, 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 radiographic instruments, which um, have relatively low throughput. We just cannot put large numbers of population through um, those um, screening programs. So we thought, can we simplify the regimen? Can we base the screening based on a blood sample? And if we can, based on the blood sample, can we um, do it for other cancers? And so basically, that is, we are asking the question, um, can we use a liquid biopsy, namely circulating tumor-derived DNA for early cancer detection? Right? It may sound very obvious, but to do this is not easy because this is truly the trying to find a needle in the haystack. Rem remember I told you that baby's DNA in the mother's circulation is a minority, and that minor minority, we're talking about 10% of the DNA. But when we're talking about early cancer detection, we are dealing with something like 1% of the DNA is from the cancer, or even less. So how can we detect, can, can this technology actually detect that small amount of DNA sensitively? So we decided to um, set up um, to do this, and um, we pinpointed one cancer to start with, and this is nasopharyngeal cancer. Um, there are a few reasons why we picked this cancer. One reason is, as shown on this map, this is a map of China. The um, region that is shown in red is the um, locality that has very high incidence of nasopharyngeal cancer, in short, NPC. You can see the black wording down there, that's Hong Kong, where I'm from. And so Hong Kong is within a region where there is a high incidence of NPC. And the second reason why we pick MPC is that it's interesting in, in that this cancer is known to be causally related to the infection of Epstein-Barr virus. So we thought, well, the virus might serve as a good tumor marker for, we, for us to do this experiment. And by the way, we wanted to do this experiment not just for nasopharyngeal cancer. We wanted to use this as an example to showcase what, how far a liquid biopsy can go in terms of its clinical utility. And so we started this research, research actually quite a while ago, back in 1999. And in those days, we just used simple technologies. We developed a PCR assay um, targeting against the EBV and tried to detect plasma EBV DNA. And then in those days, um, we started um, simply, that is, we collected blood samples from patients who have been unwell presented to the hospital and have been confirmed to have MPC. All right, we just first wanted to see if the technology can detect confirmed MPC. But even that was already a hurdle because people said that that test cannot be specific. The reason is because Epstein-Barr virus, the other name for it is everybody's virus because 99% of the population is already infected with the virus. So people said that your test is going to detect everybody. But to our surprise, we found out that only a small proportion of healthy individuals would have positive EBV DNA, DNA in their circulation. So whereas patients who have been diagnosed with MPC, we can detect 96% of them. So after a lot of research, we realized that although most of us have been infected with EBV, those EBV stays dormant within the blood cells. And there is no major release of EBV DNA fragments into the circulation. They're just hiding. Whereas for those patients who have the cancer, the cancer is undergoing cell death, so the cancer is actively releasing the DNA molecules into the circulation, and so that's why it's useful. And we, because this cancer, if diagnosed, it is actually uh, in early stages, is very treatable by radiotherapy. And we use this um, EBV um, DNA test in the plasma to track the progress of the patients. You can see that for patients who after radiotherapy do, um, do well, they, the EBV DNA levels will stay low all the time. As opposed to patients who later on develop metastases or complications, 
the EBV DNA level would start to creep up. So it is a useful marker, not, for not just for diagnosis, but also for monitoring. But we also know that for a cancer like MPC, the stage at which you diagnose makes a huge difference to the progression-free survival probability of the patient. So you can see in this graph, if diagnosed in stage one, there's more than 90% progression-free survival. But if diagnosed in stage four, then the prognosis is much worse. And Unfortunately, based on the historical data in Hong Kong, 70% of the patients are diagnosed in stages three and four. They're shown in orange and red. So it means that whether the patient will do well or not, it has been cast in stone on the day the patient is diagnosed. And so we thought, based on what we were trying to achieve, we cannot just wait for the patients to present themselves. We have to be proactive we decided to go out to the community to find individuals to come and receive the test and see if we can detect MPC even before they know it. And we had to mount a cost-effective study because this time we, cannot, we can no longer recruit patients in the hospital. We have to move to the community, but we have a limited research budget, so we have to design a study that is cost-effective. So we reviewed the epidemiological data of MPC in Hong Kong, and we found out that the peak incidence is in male individuals between ages 40 to 62. And in this age group, the incidence is about 34 MPCs per 100,000 individuals, all right? 34 per 100,000. But we only had enough funding to screen 20,000 individuals. There's one-fifth of this population. And so by screening one-fifth of this uh, population, we should be um, expecting to detect about one-fifth of 35 cases, so about seven cases. So we designed our study that we wanted to go out to the community to recruit 20,000 male individuals aged between 40 to 62 who has, after a questionnaire, confirmed to have absolutely no symptoms of having MPC. And we were expecting to detect seven MPC cases in this cohort. So this is our testing protocol because now we have to detect early cases. So the number one thing we had to do was we have to optimize our PCR assay to improve its sensitivity. After we've done that, we went out to the community, went to all 18 districts in Hong Kong, and we um, recruited individuals, and we tested them in real time. If they were tested negative, then we'll leave them at stat. If they were tested positive, because we were thinking that someone with intercurrent illness, such as infectious mononucleosis, that would release EBV DNA in the circulation, and we don't want to wrongly pinpoint them as having MPC. So the testing protocol requires these individuals to come back in four weeks' time for second testing. And if for second testing they're negative, we leave it as that. But for individuals who are tested positive on both occasions, it means that there's something in the body that is persistently releasing EBV DNA into the circulation, and these people are of very high risk of having MPC. For these patients, we then send them um, to the ENT surgeons for nasal endoscopy and also uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, testing. And then if they were confirmed to have MPC, they will be treated by radiotherapy. So in other words, this study was uh, performed prospectively. We do this in real time. We treat patients as we go. But we also need to find out whether we have missed anybody who have MPC because our test may not be sensitive at all. So we actually phone follow up these individuals annually for a period of five years to see how many cases we would have missed. So this was the protocol. So after 143 recruitment sessions. So what we did was because we were recruiting individuals from community, Monday to Friday they were working. So we can only conduct these sessions on the weekends. And 143 weekends means three years. So taking us three years without fail, we recruited 20,000 subjects. And about 5% of them, about 1,000 individuals, they were tested, on the first, uh, tested positive on the first occasion. And then we wanted to make sure which one, um, which um, subject amongst this cohort have persistent release of EBV DNA. Upon the second testing, only about 1.5%, about 300 individuals have positive EBV on both occasions. 
So we sent all these individuals for nasal endoscopy, um, but only 300 of the 309 individuals um, accepted further testing. And so they received nasal endoscopy, and 275 of them also received MRI. To our surprise, remember, we were expecting to detect seven cases, but instead of seven, we detected 34. And of these 34, 70% of them were early stages in the first and second stage, as shown in blue and green. So, in fact, our um, 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 ENT surgeon who collaborated with us on this study, he was very glad to see these cases. He said that in his usual practice, he would be seeing late stage cases with fungating tumors. But the patients that we detected, most of them had early stages and they had very small nasopharyngeal cancer that they had to have um, only skillful, um, they have, have to um, be very skillfully, um, use, skillfully interpret the nasal en endoscopy image. And also the MRI actually helped. Because, for example, in this MRI scan, um, the tumor growth was actually submucosal, which actually refueled the tumor there. And um, then we, um, we, 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 were, we were very glad to see that we detected the MPC, and majority of them turned out to be early stages. But then we had to ask, so why were we detecting so many MPC cases? Um, were we detecting MPCs unnecessarily? So then we had to look into our annual phone follow-up data, all right? And then it was interesting to find out that by the time we published this study, we actually have followed up these patients only for 22 months, a, a, range from, uh, 20, uh, a median of 22 months, ranging from 12 to 44 months. Uh, but by now, we have actually um, finished um, following them up for five years. And based on the publication data, um, remember I told you that of the 309, um, who were deemed high risk for MPC, nine patients refused to have any further testing. And one of these nine individuals, actually when we phoned this person, he, he, he was willing to speak to us on the phone. By 32 months after the testing, he told us that he was confirmed with a diagnosis of a late stage MPC. And he actually died two months after um, that phone call. And so this is the only piece of precious data that we have in the study to potentially suggests that maybe the test is advancing the MPC diagnosis by some 32 months. Of course, we have to continue to do the study to prove this point, but this is the early glimpse of data that maybe the test is advancing the diagnosis. So the other thing is, we want to know, well, have we missed a lot of MPC? Maybe we are just detecting um, um, MPCs unnecessarily, but not the um, traditional ones um, who has um, poor prognosis, but actually, we found out that we rarely missed any cases. So we missed one case, the patient, uh, the subject was tested negative by our test, but reported to have developed nasopharyngeal cancer four months into the study. We've also missed this case, um, who um, was reported to have MPC 22 months in the study. But we're not sure, so sure if we would miss this case, because if we had enough funding, maybe we could have done another screening every 12 months, and we, maybe we could have picked up this case. So we don't know. All right. So overall, the test actually had 97% sensitivity and um, more than 98% specificity. And this was MPC screening in an asymptomatic population. And this reached a positive predictive value of 11%. And this is quite impressive in a completely asymptomatic community. That is about one in 10 of the positive reports that we issue, they had MPC. And actually, I also want to tell you the significance of this data. Remember, if we didn't have this testing, we were expecting seven MPCs this year for this cohort. And there should be another seven next year because the data I reported to you were annual incidents. So we should be detecting seven this year, seven next year, and seven after. But in our follow-up studies, what we found is that we detected very few MPC in the five-year follow-up. And instead, we picked them all up in the first screening, the data match. We picked up five times the number that we were expecting. So we think that the data is telling us that maybe the test is sensitive enough to pick up the MPCs who would otherwise present over the next five years. Of course, we're still doing study to confirm this point, but 
we, what we're seeing is that there's no increase in overall incidence of IP, uh, MPC over the five-year period. So it means that we have not been inventing MPC diagnoses unnecessarily. But hopefully the future um, data would also support this. And because we're treating patients in real time, we could also follow up their progression-free survival data. And we found out that the patients who have been identified by us, their survival, the progression-free survival statistics is one-tenth better than the traditional historical cohort. So you can see the hazard ratio is 0.1. It means that they have 10 times better progression-free survival. So to um, summarize this part of the study, we were actually the first, we believe we were the first pros prospective study to use circulating tumor-derived DNA for screening asymptomatic community individuals for early detection of A cancer in the form of MPC. We showed that the test led to downstaging of the diagnosis of MPC, and it actually reduced mortality in this particular cohort. So because of um, this data, it was published in um, 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this journal actually every year, at the end of the year, they would pick 10 of the most notable studies that they have published within that year. So in December 2017, um, when the most notable studies list came out, our study was actually one of them. So we were very pleased um, with um, um, this um, um, study. Now, I'm coming to nearing the end of this presentation. So I've told you a lot about MPC. So remember I said that we use MPC as a model system to show how far we can push the technology of liquid biopsy. So then we started to think about, well, can we really push liquid biopsy further for the other cancers? So again, we have to go back to our technology base because we are diagnostic medicine specialists. We thought, well, what are the ways of detecting tumor DNA? So you can detect copy number gains or losses that originate from the original cells, as I've shown you in the follicular lymphoma case. That's one way. Um, you can actually detect if there are mutations of the DNA molecule, as shown in the angry emoji there. Or you can detect the methylation differences um, between the circulating um, DNA, um, the tumor versus the non-tumor. So those are the approaches. But remember I told you that circulating DNA, they are short molecules. And in fact, we found out that the shortness of the molecules differs between tumor and non-tumor DNA. So what I haven't told you is that we actually further deeply analyzed the EBV DNA molecules in the circulation of patients who have been confirmed by MPC versus those who were false positive. And please look at the red curves in these two graphs. So these curves are actually the um, frequency of the size of the DNA molecules. So you can see that all of the DNA molecules are shorter than 250 bases, but the red curve for the MPC patient, they, um, those EBV DNA molecules, they're actually longer than the EBV DNA molecules that we detect in the false positive cases. So it means that the false positive cases, the EBV comes from other sources, all right? So we thought, hey, can we use this as a feature to detect um, cancers when we don't have EBV DNA in the circulation, namely for other cancers? So we asked a very interesting biological question. Actually, if the, can the DNA molecules are of different length, maybe the tumor-derived DNA, they have different ending sites in the genome compared with the non-tumor DNA. So we asked, well, do the ending sites of cell-free DNA differ between different tissues of origin? And so we used um, 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 samples um, from patients who have received liver transplant. And um, because um, patients who have received liver transplant, we can use the genotype differences between the donor and the recipient to identify which DNA molecule came from the liver and which DNA molecule did not come from the liver. And so we've taken one of the samples and we sequenced this sample, the plasma DNA molecules, to very, very high depth, the equivalent to 260-fold coverage of the human genome. And then, we are of all the molecules, we will separate all oh, this molecule is from the donor, that molecule is from the recipient. So namely, if it's from the donor, it's from the liver. And because we have so many molecules covered across the genome, when we align them, we would see multiple molecules covering each part of the genome. But then we saw something really interesting. We found out that there are regions in your genome where many plasma DNA molecules end at that site. So it means that plasma DNA doesn't end randomly. It's particularly cut at certain sites. And certain sites are the favorable sites for the liver DNA, and other sites are the favorable DNA for the non-liver DNA. So this is a cartoon depiction, but let me show you real data. So this is alignment data on a region of chromosome 4. 
So you can see that there are regions where, uh, so and, and the peaks are actually the frequency we see a plasma DNA molecule ending at that site. So you can see that there are sites that are particularly popular, particularly tall peaks. There are sites both the red molecules and the blue molecules like to end at, so those are common, cut, common cutting sites. There are sites where the liver DNA particularly likes to cut at, and there are sites where the non-liver DNA particularly likes to cut at. And more interestingly is that we thought, well, if we just count the number of molecules with the liver preferred ending sites over the non-liver preferred ending sites and get a ratio, that might reflect the proportion of liver DNA in the circulation. And surprisingly, it did. So we compare that metric with a conventional traditional metric. The traditional metric is just used to genotype differences between the donor and the recipient to get a fraction. And then we found out that the two metrics, the new metrics and the old metric, they had correlation. But what is even more surprising is that you see many dots on this um, graph, meaning that I actually analyzed samples um, on more than one patient. But I actually mined for those ending sites just using samples from one, a, a sample from one patient. And so for the other liver transplant recipients, they have different genotype differences between um, the donor and the recipient. And despite so, the preferred ending site seems to be universal across different patients. And also, the other dots that I'm reporting to you, I didn't spend a lot of money to sequence those samples deeply. Those are just routine sequencing, shallow sequencing. And I can still see enough of the preferred ending sites to give you a ratio of the liver DNA in, that, um, in those samples. So it means that this preferred ending site is likely to be a universal phenomenon. It's not a chance phenomenon that occurs only in that one particular patient whom we've analyzed um, very detailedly. Then we also moved on to haplocellular carcinoma um, some, uh, 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 patients. We collected the plasma samples, and we, in this initial proof of principle study, we found about millions of sites might be the preferred ending site for liver tumor-derived plasma DNA molecules. And then, when we look for the presence of DNA molecules with such tumor-preferred ending sites, you can see that they're enriched in the HCC patients compared with the non-HCC patients. And I'm going to end here. Time is running out. The question is, why are there differential cutting sites? Well, we believe that it has something to do with the chromatin structure. Remember, every, every organ, they have different function. They have different gene expression. The gene expression governs the chromatin structure. And DNA, we think, it cuts around the, um, the, the um, nucleosomes. And where the genome is not covered by proteins, it will be completely chopped up and may not be detectable. So when it becomes plasma DNA, the ending sites of the plasma DNA are actually telling us where the chromatin docking is. And because different organs have different chromatin structure, the resultant DNA molecules have different ending sites. And now we actually have expanded and uh, mined for preferred ending sites for different organs. And this is, again, another early proof of principle study that to show that we may be able to not just use DNA methylation, which I've shown you earlier. Maybe we can use plasma DNA ending sites to differentiate which organ that molecule came from. And so to summarize, plasma DNA actually has many facets. You can analyze its sequence, plain sequence, the methylation, you can count it, you can measure its length, and now you can also determine its ending site. So to summarize, circulating nucleic acids has reached prime time. For NIPT prenatal testing, it has been a steep learning curve, um, but it is clinically implemented around the world, and there are expanding applications. As for liquid biopsy, it will take longer because there are heterogeneity between cancers, so we have to do research for each cancer um, one step at a time but some applications are beginning to mature. And what, what I've just shown you about the ending sites and also the size of DNA molecules, we like to call it fragmentomics, and we believe that this is going to be an expanding field. So please stay tuned. So lastly, I'd like to thank all the collaborators and my team member for, and also my grant funding for um, allowing us to generate the data that I presented to you this morning. Thank you.